Right, so let's, uh, let's get cracking. Um, well, by, by way of introduction, um, last meeting, um, Colin, who's just been speaking, um, gave an excellent uh, presentation on uh, digital operating. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, that's quite cutting edge. Um, so it's quite a contrast um, that tonight, I'm actually going back to the 60s and before, um, because for my sins, I restored a 1960s transmitter KW Vanguard. Um, now looking in throughout the room, then uh, there's quite a few people in this room that were definitely uh, licensed and active amateurs at that time. Um, so apologies in advance, you're probably going to be bored stiff, but nevertheless... Fantastic, fantastic, very, very similar thing. Um, and thinking about putting the presentation together, I thought, well, if I just sit here and just go about restoring a vanguard, it will be okay, but why don't I just bulk it out a bit and, uh, and just give one or two more bits and pieces? So what I decided is that um, it'll cover how radio started, that spark gap transmission and reception. It's just a couple of slides of things I've pulled off the, uh, the web um, because I just wanted to know a little bit more about, uh, about you know, what Marconi was up to and things like that. But it's, not, it's only a couple of slides, very, very brief. Um, and then um, valve transistor oscillators and, and power amplifiers uh, and principles of amplitude modulation. Um, so, again, there's just two or three slides. By the time I've got through all of those, then hopefully when I start talking about restoring the KW Vanguard, then it'll all make a little bit of sense. So, when you're all seated comfortably, I'll begin. Uh, so, first of all, I'm just gonna look at the spark gap transmitter. Um, I've put words in it as well so that the, the presentation is complete. Um, Spark was invented around 1890 and perfected by Marconi in 1895. Um, but what actually is a spark gap transmitter? Well, let's not get confused with, um, you know, sine waves and oscillators and all that sort of thing. A spark gap transmitter is just a noise generator. In other words, the thing that we try and get rid of these days, like um, interference, you know, from spark plugs and interference from motors and things like that. Um, but that's exactly what, in essence, a spark gap transmitter is. So um, there's a, a little circuit I pulled off the internet. So you've got uh, an alternator, uh, a Mosky, and then a step-up transformer. Oh, it's all marked anyway, yeah. And then you've got this, this tuned circuit here. Um, now, I'm just thinking, uh, and the internet is very, very sparse. Um, you've got a tuned circuit with the aerial and earth, and you've also got this tuned circuit here. I'm assuming it's, it's kept away from the aerial and earth because if you connected the aerial earth directly to it, it would damp the circuit, etc. So it tunes it a little bit. Um, but, you know, let's be honest about it. When we say tunes it, um, it is still a very, very broad transmission from a, from a spark gap. So when you, when you throw the Morse key, then this whacking great big... Um, current flows because it's a step-up transformer and voltage and sparks across a spark gap and just generates a load of interference. Is that a fair assessment of what a spark gap transmitter is for those that you know? Yeah, right, that's going on. Right, so that's it. So, so that's the spark gap transmitter. Um, so what did we use for a receiver? Well, this is way before uh, valves were invented by Fleming um, so there was nothing to amplify anything. Um, so this cohere, cohere receiver, cohere receiver. Cohere receiver. This cohere receiver. Um, it's just a device. It consists of a tube containing two electrodes, small distance apart, and then loose metal filings in the space between. So there's absolutely no amplification. So the thing that drives the thing is the is the the RF, the whatever it is that, uh, that is transmitted. Um, and so all it, all it would do is activate a bell or a buzzer. 
uh, and that was the sound made by a spark gap transmitter. So um, if anybody's seen the film Titanic, and I think it's the first one that they made, where uh, um, it mimics the sound of the, of the ship where there's a, a heterodyne CW signal, not true. That, that isn't. It's, it was just a lot of absolute, you know, hash, and it, it drove a buzzer or something like that, and so that was what, that's what, what CW was. It was just a buzzer. Um, Yeah, that, he just, he just rectified it. Joined, it. Didn't even do that. It just coherently joined a whole load of iron filings together. Yeah, that, yeah. So, so the the iron filings That's made the resistance change, and therefore that you could connect it to a bell or a buzzer, and it would ring it. I understood you couldn't. But okay. Yeah. Uh, you and then, and, uh, it, it's true that and then the um, iron filings, the um, uh, connection then had to be broken. It did because it was and stuck in that position. Yeah. Did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Look, I just thought I'd put that in just to, um, you know, dispel um, the thought about spark gap transmitters that they were, they were, you know, um, single frequency sort of transmitters, which they weren't. It was just really a way of pushing energy. What you were transmitting was. <laughs> that's it. That, that's, a, that's, exa that's exactly what I was meaning. So it wasn't beep, 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 beep. It was, bzz, bzz. yeah, that's very good. What a team we make. Okay, so that's it. So that's, that's just, um, so it wasn't possible um, to modulate that sort of transmission with speech or music, etc. Okay? Right, so that's it. So uh, that was just a couple of slides on the spark gap transmitter. So we okay with that? Right, okay. So. Um, let's just put, so, uh, as soon as the valve was perfected, I think it was invented by Fleming, and that was just the diode, and then, Forest. there was, De 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 deforest, De um, it depends what, I looked on the, on the internet, and some said Fleming, and some said deforest. Yeah, yeah. Abs absolutely. So, so I, I'm, I'm sure you're right with that. So, um, De Forest stuck an electrode uh, in it and found that by a very small variation in voltage on that, it would cause a, a, large vari a larger variation in voltage or current um, flowing through the circuit, and therefore you've got an amplifier. So, as soon as you've got an amplifier, um, then... Um, you can, with feedback, um, develop an oscillator. And uh, here's the circuit of a valve oscillator, very, very simple. And here's one for a transistor. But if you look, uh, th that's, that's just a, a, a buffer stage. But if you look, it's almost exactly the same. Uh, so whether it's a valve or a transistor, then that was really the start of it, because um, that is a true RF signal. Uh, and of course, if you wanted to make a crystal oscillator for a single frequency, you just take, took out the tuned circuit and put crystal in. Um, oh, hang on a second. All oh, right, so I'm just going to go backwards and forwards a little bit here um, because I've made two copies of this presentation, and obviously this is a slightly older one, but never mind. Um, so as soon as um, you could get a, uh, an oscillator, um, then... This is, this is the output that you could get from the oscillator, so a nice, a nice sine wave. And that's, uh, that's just uh, viewed on my, uh, my rather ancient scope. You can, you can. <laughs> you can, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, so uh, uh, I mean, there you've got the, uh, um, the time base on the, uh, on the oscillator uh, locked to the, uh, to the incoming signal. Um, and then if you just uh, slow it down a bit, then that's, that's a complete carrier wave. So, you know, that's as we know as, a, as, a, as an RF carrier wave now that we use either for CW uh, or modulator with amplitude modulation I'm going on now or, uh, or FM. So, uh, so that's, that's a carrier wave. Like, so let me just, let me just then go back again now. So we've, uh, we've generated our RF signal. Um, so... Um, we need to amplify that up. And uh, 
this is the this is the circuit of the uh, the RF stage of my KW Vanguard. So you see straight away here you've got this is the oscillator, um, and it covers every amateur band. Uh, so you've got oscillator. You've then got two stages of amplification before it goes to the PA. Uh, now, if you look at this, then it's got three separate tuned circuits, and with those, it will cover every amateur band uh, from 80 up to 10 meters. And that's because, um, depending on the, on the frequency, then um, for 80 and 40, um, it's just a, this first one's just a resistive amplifier, every, every, and, and the same with the... Uh, uh, same with the, the output one. Uh, every other is either um, doubling or tripling the, the output frequency. So the oscillator runs on either 80 meters, which is that coil there, 40 meters, or if you think about it, if, if you double the frequency, then you're doubling the coverage, aren't you? So in other words, if you've got uh, a VFO, well, let's say from um, 3.5 to 4, um, then if you double it, then it's covering double the amount of bandwidth. So um, this one here runs on 80 meters, but um, the, the band it covers is less, otherwise it would cover more, more of the band than it should do. So is, is that fairly straightforward? So in other words, uh, a simple carrier wave transmitter, um, there's no complex technology. It's just purely and simply you get an oscillator and then you just amplify it up. Is that fairly clear? Good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. So that said, additional amplification stages can be added, either tuned or untuned, until the desired uh, output level is is achieved. And and again, that's that's the output that you get on it. Okay. So, just go through that. Uh, so now that we've got uh, a nice single uh, frequency carrier wave, we're in a position uh, to be able to modulate it. Um, now, a, a modulator, this is, this is high-level modulation. Um, a modulator is really just an audio amplifier. And uh, although this one uses valves, um, in fact, th this is the modulator in my homebrew transmitter. Um, this is the circuit that I, I use. So it's just got a preamplifier, which is a valve, but it could be a transistor. It's got another preamplifier, and then this, just, this is just a phase splitter uh, to, to drive the two valves, or they could be transistors, uh, in push-pull. Um, the only, so it's modulated the same as an audio amplifier. Um, for high-level modulation, the audio output has to be half the transmitted input power. In other words, a 50-watt transmitter needs a 25-watt audio amplifier, and that's for high-level modulation. Um, the output transformer, a modulation transformer, um, has a much higher output impedance uh, to match the PA. So in other words, if it was an audio amplifier, the secondary on that transformer would be, what, between 3 and 8 ohms, uh, but it's a much higher uh, impedance. Uh, and this is an example of a, a modulation transformer. Um, this is a, a, a Woden 2, so it's a, a fairly big device. Um, and the approximate uh, impedance, the starting impedance, when you, if you're building something and calculating it, is it's the voltage applied to the PA uh, over, the, uh, over the PA current. That's approximate. So um, say, for example, um, in a valve amplifier, if you had... Uh, a, a high tension voltage of 450 volts, and it was drawing 100 milliamps, uh, then that's 450 times by point run. Uh, <clears throat> so it would be it divided by point one. So that would be an output impedance of about 4,500 ohms. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good, good. Are you all right there, at that, Colin? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm on the wrong side these times. <laughs> okay, good, good. good. Okay, um, apologies for this rather um, um, <coughs> fuzzy sort of, um, that's just how, it, how I picked it up. Um, so the modulation transformer is put in series with the, the power uh, amplifier, the, PA, the RFPA, whether it's valve or transistor. So there it is, that's in series, the, the 
high voltage goes into there, goes through that, and then goes to the, uh, uh, the power amplifier. Okay? So, um, if we just look at the impact it's going to have on the, on the output. So, um, if you've got two voltages in series, then um, if they're in, in phase, then they would add. If they are out of phase, then they would subtract. Um, so, um, and that also applies to an AC waveform, which is going up and down like that. So, um, let's say you've got, um, so you've got the standing HT voltage, and then um, as the modulator gives an output, uh, and it's in a positive phase, then that will lift the voltage applied to the PA. And then as it goes to negative, it would reduce the voltage to the PA. So um, you are amplitude modulating by varying the voltage on the PA. Okay? Everybody happy with that? Okay. <coughs> Right, so just an example, and this is, um, when I got the KW Vanguard, then um, I uh, was reading lots of um, an articles in, this was about shortwave mag, because I wanted to understand uh, the stock faults of them and, and what people had done since they were designed in the 60s. And so this is an extract from shortwave magazine. It says, taking the KW Vanguard as an example, the DC supply to the PA is 425 volts the voltage at peak of modulation cycle will be 850 volts. That's not me speaking, that's shortwave magazine. Okay, so um, here is the first demonstration then. So this is um, an AM modulation scope demo. So I need to switch on the audio. You're using that just as an app? Yeah, because um, I've got those NAF speakers there, but this is brilliant. Is that working? Oh, that's not very good. Oh, well. But, right, so... <coughs> um, that was quite quick, but if you notice um, how it lifts the output of the transmitter. So that was the, that's the RF output. Does that make sense? So as soon as the tone comes on, I'll just do it again. It lifts the output of the transmitter. And in fact, on 100% uh, modulation, it's double the voltage. Or double the RF output. Okay. Okay, so um, what would happen if we used voice? So give it another go, and this is, this is um, so rather than that tone, so you could see the nice, you know, the nice 1KC tone, this is um, what happens to the RF output measured on a scope um, when you modulate it. This is 2 really zero XP set. This is 2E0 XBZ, modulation test. This is 2E0 XBZ. This is 2E0 XBZ, modulation test. And I did that on air and somebody came back to me. Oh, flipping hell. <laughs> Just when I don't want them to do it. Yes, Martin, it sounds very nice. Go away. But there we are. So, um, does that make sense? So, sorry, Martin. So does that mean then that when it is effectively 
Simon. Yeah. You are still transmitting at, at that. A 50 watt carrier. Watt yeah. You're, you're, you're transmitting a 50 watt carrier, right? So um, let's just go out for again. So at that moment in time, there's no modulation, right? So you can watch it again. So as soon as I start speaking. This is to the CLXB. It actually goes off the scale. This is 2E0XBZ, modulation test. Okay, and for anybody that knows, yes, I was over-modulating there a little bit, uh, purely and simply because um, I wanted to speak loudly into this device I was recording. So I would have uh, looked on the I would have turned it down. So yes, that was, uh, in fact, going over. Oh, right, so final one is... What does that do to peak power output? So here we are again. Another one. And this is um, with my MFJ power meter. So on goes the transmitter. This is 2E0XBZ. 2E0 X-Ray Bravo Zulu. KW Vanguard AM modulation test. This is 2E0XBZ, 2E0 X-Ray Bravo Zulu, KW Vanguard AM modulation test. Okay, does that make sense? Right, so, so in other words, um, that is just measuring the peak power. It's a, it's a, the the uh, uh, power meter is in peak power mode. Okay. So that is how amplitude modulation works. Does that make sense to everybody? Sorry, guys. Does that mean that these big uh, medium wave AM transmitters are transmitting, you know, kilowatts all yes. the way even when silent? Megawatts in some cases. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I have to say that a lot of them use more efficiency modulation. Um, so what they do is rather than vary the uh, voltage to the power amplifier stage, um, they actually they actually run they they actually modulate the input to it. Yes. Um, that's what a lot of them do now. Um, AM transmitters, now this is a whole subject in itself because um, there's, um, I, 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 as a bit of an aside, I was reading an article about, uh, about AM transmission and there's unbelievably complex um, compression and enhancement techniques used um, even on, on AM transmissions. Um, and there was one thing that I've only just found out and I couldn't quite understand myself. And that was, I remember back in the, in the 60s, listening to the Voice of America. And the speech was always really clear and really good. And then when they played music, the quality was absolutely yes. horrible. And it was purely and simply uh, that the, uh, the modulator was set up for speech with, with compression enhancements that... Um, voice sound actually killed it but but to an answer your question um, yeah but then if you've got an FM transmitter as soon as you press the key then you're transmitting 50 watts until you start speaking okay right so yeah you are you just varying the frequency yeah Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so, 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 some, what they do is um, they cut the top off yes. at a high frequency. And what they do is they sometimes they, um, they um, reduce the LF by about 6 dB. 
then it's got a slow slope going up. Um, and in fact, some even emphasize some of the higher frequencies, but then over and above the certain, there's a, there's a cut put on them, it chops them off completely, yeah. Okay, right. So hopefully um, that will give you a better understanding of what we mean by amplitude modulation. So amplitude modulation is exactly as the name says. All we're doing is varying the output of the transmitter uh, amplitude-wise, okay? Right, so that's got, right, so now we come on to the, uh, the KW Vanguard transmitter. Um, so, um, as most of you know, I bought this um, second-hand and uh, with a, one, of, one of my interests has always been AM. Um, and to be fair, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a, almost like a, a, an increasing body of people use, uh, you are using AM. Um, VMARS, the Vintage Military Amateur Radio Society, has, has 600 members. Um, on a Saturday, there is a, a net. Um, I don't join that because it's just absolute mayhem. Um, and, and if they have any special events, you've got to be careful. They, they're just so very, very busy. So I just drive a put a call out um, and get somebody to reply individually. Right at the end of the presentation, then uh, I've got a recording of the, uh, of the SDR uh, that I did earlier today. Uh, and 80 metres was crap today, but nevertheless, it was so good. Um, so, um, my methodology when I restored it was, when completed, it must be as reliable as possible. Um, the unit is very, very heavy. Um, it's like a sack of cement. Um, and it's difficult to get in and out of its case, and it really is, because um, it, when you take it out, if you aren't careful, you scratch something. Um, and uh, I didn't want to keep doing this and carrying it upstairs. back upstairs into my workshop. Yeah, because um, I've got a shack, you've seen my shack, for those that went to the barbecue. Um, but upstairs in the fourth bedroom, um, I have a, I have a, a workshop. Um, but to get there, I've got to carry it the length of the garden, um, through the house, up two lots of stairs, so it goes into a little landing, then I go up again to another lot of stairs, uh, and that's where it is. So, I ain't going to do that. I just you remember you left something back in the chair, not that heavy. Oh, that, that, oh well, Steve, you know, that always happens, doesn't it? You do that and you think, where's the mic? <laughs> so, I... <laughs> Yeah. Better okay. transporter. Yeah. Now okay. I decided to leave heavy things downstairs and uh, yeah. bring bring stuff from the uh, workshop down to the radio. Okay. And uh, the, there are many features in magazines. Oh, the, the other thing is, there's many features in magazines and vintage equipment, and group oil sites or oh, enthusiasts bringing equipment back to life slowly, using a yes. variac to full power. Okay. There are also equally many subsequent features of the equipment failing big time shortly afterwards with a bang and lots of smoke. Uh, and that's right, you know, because, um, great, um, you're really just, um, <coughs> just delaying the inevitable. Um, so what I decided is that since I'm retired, I'll spend as much time as needed to fully check every component, replace every item that has an age related serviceability life. Um, so this is the KW Vanguard as received. Um, doesn't look too bad. Um, you can only just see, but you can probably see the meter glass is broken. You see that little line up there? Just about, hopefully. Um, and the geloso surround is all cracked there. And that there, which you can't really see, is a piece of black insulating tape over a great big hole. And all 12 vowels were missing, apart from a rather old and decrepit 6146 in the PA. So every single vowel was missing. Um, so the KW Vanguard has received topside. Um, so a little bit rusty. Um, valve base has tarnished due to vowels being removed, presumably many years ago. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Uh, KW Vanguard has received underside. Absolutely excellent condition. Um, to be fair, yes. could have been made yesterday. Um, no problem with it at all. So I can only assume that it had been taken out of its case, um, left open 
on a, a workbench or something like that, um, and somebody had taken all the valves out. So, um, was, I, uh, was I happy? Yes, a little bit disappointed that all the valves had gone, but, well, you know, hey-ho, that was it. Um, I paid £195 for it. Um, there was one on eBay a couple of weeks ago for £600. Um, within the week, it had gone. I don't think somebody paid £600 for it uh, because on the KW Group I.O., there was um, several people that said they lived near the guy um, and one of them said he bought it. So I reckon he made him an offer. Uh, but nevertheless, um, when you consider, well, I suppose it's all relative, isn't it? Um, brand new, it was £42. Um, but then £42 in 1960 yeah. was worth a hell of a lot of money. It's a bit like petrol now. It is, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so, um, here's a circuit diagram. Um, this is a KW Vanguard Mark I. Um, and the reason I've brought this up is that's the Mark II and it's not easy to see. Um, the only difference is this one doesn't have a clamp valve. So, um, if I just quickly go through the circuit, very, 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 very simple. Um, so, you've got a heater transformer, a, a separate heater transformer, because... Um, you know, if you're switching things on and off, you've got to keep all the valves lit all the time, so that's a heater transformer. Um, there's also a transformer for the modulator, uh, which is separate, and that would be switched off when you're using CW, and that's uh, a power supply for the, uh, the RF section up here. Um, there's also, um, these are regulator valves. Um, mine has got two because um, the whole of this, this RF section here, which is the, the circuit I showed you earlier, um, it has got two stabilised supply. Um, the, uh, the, the driver valve here runs off 300 volts, and that's from two stabilisers in series with a, a, a tap in the middle to drive the VF4, which runs off 150 volts. And then you've just got a PA here, which is very, very simple, and then this is just a matching network here. Um, so see how simple an AM transmitter is? Relatively simple. OK, so let's go through there. So... Restoration started, and the restoration started um, with, um, I have to say, um, I restored it before even plugging it in. I resisted the temptation, didn't plug it in. Why would I want to plug it in when I'm going to restore it? So I just left it. The only thing I did do is I uh, just DC um, continuity and to earth checked all four transformers, including the modulation transformers, and were all were perfect. So in other words, it was worth restoring. So, um, first of all, all electric, capa electric capacitors to be replaced. And this is me taking them all out. Um, because um, they were made in the 60s. Um, and electrolytics and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a chemical reaction, etc. Um, so, um, replacements are relatively cheap. So, why not replace them all? And so, that's exactly what I did. Um, so, uh, here it is with them all replaced. So, there's two, there's two supplies. Um, so, the capacitors, these are the RF section, and this is the, the audio, the modulator there and there. So, the first thing to do, just replace those. Don't even bother checking them. Um, using brand new high ripple current types, okay? Um, next, the modulator electrolytics. There were four uh, electrolytics in the modulator. Um, these two... These two here um, decouple the, the main uh, HT supply lines. Um, and these little yellow ones here are what's called cathode bias capacitors. Um, so in simplistic terms, the valves have a negative bias. And a negative bias is achieved by you just put a resistor in the cathode. So if you put a resistor in the cathode uh, to earth then if you connect a resistor from earth to the grid, it will be at a negative potential. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm not going to go right into it. But anyway, so um, to, stop, uh, <coughs> to stop the... Um, as, as the valve works on either RF uh, or AF, um, then the signal would, would cause the cathode um, 
voltage to vary and unless you put a capacitor on it to decouple that then um, it would be putting negative feedback and the gain would be going up and down as well. So those are, those are cathode bias capacitors. So there were four in there. Um, they, were, they were just no longer capacitors. Um, they were bulged and this is on, a, on an AVO meter. Uh, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't, normally on an AVO meter, which has got a battery in, um, if you put a, a low value capacitor that's non-polarised either way around, it would just flick up momentarily and go down to zero. An electrolytic capacitor um, using an AVO, uh, bearing in mind that the AVO, the positive is the negative on an AVO, so if you get the polarity right, a, a, good, a good electrolytic should start up like that, virtually short circuit, and gradually come down like that. Um, well, um, I was going to change them anyway, but just as a matter of interest, um, that one red, uh, well, that's, that's 2K, so, and it was just there. It wasn't varying up and down, it was just, uh, it was just uh, so they, they were completely and literally shot. Okay, so there we are, all four replaced, um, those two there and those two there, so that was a relatively simple job. Okay, next, all 12 valve bases to be replaced. Um, now, the originals were in poor condition. Um, this picture doesn't really show, but um, even on old equipment that has got valves in, if you take the valves out, then the pins are normally nice and shiny because they've been um, you know, insulated, kept from the elements. Um, the top ones are the originals. They were all grey and horrible inside, and both were. And these are brand new ones. As I said, it's difficult to see in the picture, but these are nice and shiny. Um, so uh, I decided, you know, it just wasn't worth it. I might as well replace all the valve bases. Um, where did you get them? Where I buy everything from? <laughs> eBay. <laughs> eBay. Yeah. Um, having said that, I bought several examples. All were pattern. And this picture does show a little bit. They're slightly bigger. Oh. Yeah. And when, it, when I say pattern, it was, they weren't yes. the originals. Okay. Um, so there was only one way around it. I had to get a steel file and file all the way around. And, 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 and no, but, you know, that was just it. Um, what I did is I actually got a washer that was that size and I put it over and drew around it with felt pen and then just filed all the way around it. Um, doing other jobs and bits and pieces, it probably took me about two weeks to, uh, to do them. And I think I had to uh, file his elbow by the time I finished, but there we are, that was, that was it. So that, it, needs to be, it was a horrible job, um, but it was worth it. And how did you keep the swarp out the rest of the rig? I, di I, di I didn't, to be fair. Um, if it's, it's a fairly big rig. Um, and what I had to do was, when I'd finished it, um, with a couple of um, quite fine brushes, just brush all the way right from the top, right to the bottom, everything all dripped down, then with uh, you know, a little hand vacuum cleaner, yeah, vacuum it all up, etc. So, no, I couldn't do it. Uh, I did. I started with a little, with a, a duster it was, just under where I was doing it. It doesn't work because the duster moves and it falls off. You think, I might as well just... Uh, you know, yeah, let, yeah. It go and let it go and then, and then do it to be, you know, I, again, I could only do that because it was a big old thing. Suggestion, we use at work air dusters, which is basically compressed air in the yeah. can. They're very good for cleaning out mud. I, I would imagine they are. I mean, what, what, what I did was um, um, we got um, some of the, a couple of these handheld vacs. So, and uh, this one's a quite a powerful one. So you get a brush and you're brushing it and you put it right up against it. Anyway, um, it got rid of it all. Yeah. I think the, the reason it got rid of it is because the chassis was completely dry. Oh, there was no right. grease or anything like that on it. So it, they just all fell off. Okay. Um, so um, to replace each valve base, pictures were taken at different angles of the existing component layout. Uh, this is one of many. Then valve bases were removed one at a time, a new one fitted, and every component checked for the correct value and replaced as necessary. So in practice, all carbon resistors were replaced with new carbon fuel types because almost without exception, they'd all gone high in value. Okay. 
Right, so as I was just saying, um, all the carbon resistors, um, I, had, I had new replacements anyway, um, carbon film, so they were all replaced. Um, all the polystyrene, paper, whatever you call it, capacitors, low value capacitors, uh, ceramic, uh, all tested, perfectly okay, as did the silver mica. Um, so uh, I didn't have to change any one of those, apart from a couple um, that are damaged in, uh, in taking it all to bits. So it's a leads breaker for the body. Yeah, I mean, it, it was purely and simply because um, I, I, I suspect that, that, first of all, this rig had been built by somebody. Uh, and oh, right. some parts were very, very well made, like this. Others were atrocious, and I think there might be more than one person built it. Um, so Did some they were. Sell it as a kit where you got all the parts. Yeah, you, you, could, you could buy it um, um, fully built and working, or you could buy it as a kit. It's exactly the same way as a heave kit and things like that. Okay, um, so um, after the valve base is replaced, this stage has been rebuilt, and you can see this stage that I've, uh, I've rebuilt here. Um, to be fair, um, I didn't realise after, until after I'd finished it that I was going to do a presentation. So a lot of the um, pictures I deleted, but I had this one here, so I thought I'd include it. And then I suddenly noticed, hang on a second, um, you've got this great big resistor here just hanging there like that. Um, and the reason why that is, that resistor there is in series with the uh, dial light. Um, the dial light in it um, is partly shrouded and it obviously must have got unbelievably hot. It was open circuit and it was just absolute black. Um, so when I replaced it, then what I thought I'd do is I'd put a series resistor and lower the voltage so that it was just bright enough for me to be able to see the scale. So that is just a temporary resistor there until I'd completed it and then did a, a subjective test. So that's the reason why that's like that. But all the rest of the stage, you can see um, how it's made with carbon, uh, carbon film resistors. Um, and so that's it. So, and you can, you can also see the new valve bases here as well. All nice and shiny. Okay. Uh, did you say it was in 1960? 42 pounds. 42 pounds in 1960. Yes. Well, yeah. So there's probably not a great deal of difference, is there? Because that's how much you'd, you'd pay now. If anything, rigs are probably a little bit cheaper, aren't they? Because uh, you'd get a transceiver for that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you would. Right. Um, next, the send receive wafer switch. Um, this single switch has four functions. It's the antenna changeover from uh, the up to the Vanguard uh, ATU to a separate socket to feed a receiver. Um, it also switches the mains on and off to the uh, RF HT transformer. It switches the mains onto the modulator HT transformer when AM selected. And it also switches 150 volt DC supply for the VFO. It has to be separate because there's also a tune normal switch. So it does all those functions, okay? Um, virtually every article I uh, read was change that because it cause, it can, when it goes, it goes big time. It's a bonfire when it goes up. And you can understand why. Uh, all those functions from that little switch like that. In fact, um, when I switch the Vanguard on transmit, there's a momentary flicker of, of my fluorescent tube in the, uh, in the shack. Purely and simply because you're starting up um, two mains transformers. And so there's an there's a, there's initial you know, high current take. So all that through that wafer switch. So as soon as it gets a little bit uh, dirty, then, uh, so then it goes up. So you say it depletes your supply, as you do, in your main supply as you do that, because the two transformers kick in. It's, it's, well, because you've got to build up the back EMF, so it's, it, yeah, just momentarily, for a split second. But what I'm really saying is that when you flick that wafer switch, it is flicking um, a hell of a lot of current. And if, if you look at a toggle switch, a toggle switch is made so that it works very quickly because you've got the mechanical advantage. Whereas this, if you just move that switch nice and slowly, it's going like that, okay? So, um, so... <coughs> What I did is uh, I replaced it with two new relays. Um, so one I put inside the PA compartment, so I decided to put an aerial changeover relay inside the PA compartment, 
and then a separate one underside to switch all the HTs. Okay? Um, toggle switches. And there are three toggle switches on it. Mains on off, which, is a, which was a single pole, and it switched the neutral on and off. I have no idea why. So questions, guys, from... You know, why did it switch the neutral off? Because someone wired it wrong. That, that was always an American Yeah, American. Was it? Yeah. I mean, it, it, clearly it was intentional um, because it looked like the original mains cable and it was in the, in the neutral. Okay. Was it black and white, the mains? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Black and red. Black and red, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, AM... C AMCW, that's, that, that's a, uh, a, a double pole toggle switch I'll go into in a minute. And then the normal tune is a, a four pole switch. Um, and that's why I put exclamation marks there. All add high resistance and intermittent contacts so I need replacing. Um, you look at them on DC meter, you flick it, nothing there. Flick it again, it comes on. Every time it was high resistance, so they all needed replacing. Um, so, and the mains on off switch was only a single pole. Um, and mains on off and AM switches were easily replaced. So the mains on and off switch and AMCW uh, were just single, were just, sorry, uh, both replaced with double pole toggle switches. Um, the almost identical replacement is well available on eBay still. Um, the biggest problem I had, and I'd never seen one before, was a four pole toggle switch. And that's the normal tune switch. And that is it. Okay, I, I, I looked, couldn't see any, so I thought, do you know something, why don't I just bite the bullet, Put a relay why don't you stick a relay in it, uh, nice and easy to do, um, and uh, plug in relay, so if anything happens it can replace, so just replace it with four pole, change over relay. Um, so that was really um, all I had to do, so final tasks, tasks prior to testing. Um, the drive cord needed replacing. The original must have snapped and had a knot in it. And I'll, I've got a picture of that in a minute, which restricted bank coverage. Um, external 12-volt supply, so the three new relays. So clearly, I've got relays. Um, there was no 12-volt um, uh, DC supply for them. But in the shack, I have two big 12-volt DC supplies. Um, one, one is 13.8, uh, which I use for all the rigs. And the other is 12.6, which I use for all the all the military equipment uh, that has a, uh, a 12 volt, H a 12 volt uh, heater supply. So I, I just simply uh, um, rewire them to the back. So I just put an external 12 volt supply to it. Um, the original dial, dial lights, which run from the 6.3 volt heater supply had blown. Um, I looked everywhere for, for 6.3 volt. Um, you can get them on eBay, here you can, eight pounds, uh, just for a single bulb. Um, and so then a pack of eight 12 volt of the same style and same wattage was four pound false free. So I thought, why don't I change it over? And that's exactly what I did. And I said, I thought, um, I'm not going to do the same mistake again, which is why I put that series of resistor in and drop the voltage down um, till it, it was bright enough to be able to see the scale, uh, but didn't get as hot as it did. Um, Yeah, should do. Should, I'm hoping so. Well, um, since I've got eight of the bulbs, um, then uh, <laughs> then um, if yeah, if, oh, if why I don't you sell the eight of the bulbs on eBay yeah. for four pounds each. <laughs> yeah. um, and the brand new set of valves, they cost more than the rig. They cost two hundred pounds. Um, the problem was that the um, the modulator output valves were six L sixes. Um, audio power valves, um, then, um, you know, people spend thousands of pounds buying um, audio valve amplifiers. Um, but I managed to get these from a, a company and they were, they were really good. You could get some cheaper ones from China, uh, but I decided not to do. Um, so they were the most expensive ones. And unfortunately, um, the, the output of the RF section to feed the PA was also a 606. So uh, those three were the bulk of that. Yeah, that's a reasonable price. For yeah, that's that. not bad. Well, so anyway, yeah. Um, and uh, 
what I also put is an, uh, an ATU in and out switch. And the reason I did that, uh, and I also put another socket on, on the back of it, was because uh, I have a long wire uh, in my shack and I didn't want to trail the long wire all the way through the shack and introduce the RF and also, you know, use a lot of the RF in the shack. Um, so I wanted to put um, an ATU at the top of the shack and therefore um, feed it um, uh, via a coax cable. A fairly short length of coax, um, it can accommodate without a lot of loss and I'm only talking about a couple of metres, that, that's okay to be fair. Uh, and I did exactly the same with my homebrew rig. Um, in reality, um, I did it even simpler than that because uh, what I did is I match the output of the rig, output of the, the Vanguard using the internal ATU to 50 ohms. And then I just get a piece of 50 ohm coax and then it goes to, uh, to the MFJ uh, ATU which you saw at the top of the shack. But I put that in anyway just in case I wanted to uh, switch the ATU out. And the meter glass was replaced as well. Um, and the microphone socket changed from a Bellingly, it was a, an aerial socket a type, uh, to a phono coax socket. Um, and the mains on off switch replaced with two pole with uh, a new mains cable fitted. And the Geloso VFO scale surround repaired um, with Arrowdite sprayed black, a perfect match. I could not believe how good that was. I put some masking tape on the front of it and then put some arrowdite on the back um, which, which made it nice and strong and, uh, and I was thinking what am I going to have to do to, to match it and I had some uh, Halford's black aerosol spray and I sprayed it and I, I kid you not you cannot see where I sprayed it. It was uh, uh, an unbelievable success so it was that. Um, and the bottom screen plate uh, on the RF section was missing, so a new replacement made from aluminium plate. Um, so I, I, I now just got one or two pictures to go through what I did. So um, so front panel had to be removed to fit a new drive cord. There was no way around it. Um, wasn't too bad, to be fair. And it also gave me the advantage of taking the front panel off, giving a really good clean. And then uh, I got some p car polish and uh, gave it a good polish with car polish. First time I did it, it came up all black. I rubbed that off, put some more, and it really gleamed. What a difference it made. Okay, so um, this is the, the drive cord. Can you just see there the knot? Oh, yes. Oh, right. yes. So what that meant is it only went to half scale and stopped. So that's the new one fitted. Okay, so, um, so this, is, this is after restoration. So meter glass replaced. Um, Again, good old eBay. Um, I paid six quid for a, a second-hand moving coil meter. Um, it was a Sangamo, and the dimensions were the same, so I took a little bit of a, uh, a gamble. Um, when it came, it was absolutely identical. You swapped it over. Did that include the face? No, the, fa the, fa the face is original. Um, so all I've done is, is that, that surround oh, and the glass. Surround, yeah, the other was broken, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, the internal ATU switch, that's what it's there. If you didn't know, you wouldn't know because um, I've made some nice decals that almost match, not too bad. Um, and that's the new Phono microphone input socket. And this is a VFO only on off switch. And I'll go into that a little bit later so I can run the VFO all the time because since I use web SDRs more than this, it doesn't matter if I generate a very, very low level uh, signal within the shack. What did you use for the decals on the switch? Was that um, something like Letraset or something? Or? No. <laughs> um, I purely and simply, um, in Word, printed them off uh, and then I matched the colour by, by looking yeah, at it, right, okay. running back downstairs, Changing the shade slightly, running back upstairs, uh, and so so that is that is paper with sellotape. But uh, seriously, you can hardly see it. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now it's ready for bench testing, um, and there it is on air, and it's um, driving. That's a hundred watt light bulb. Um, of course, it's the Tesco's finest, um, so it's a, a good uh, good match. I wonder if you 
think you could do that with an LED. I don't, but you no, can, you, it's no. It's the internal resistance of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so testing procedure. Um, so th this, is, this is for the first time ever I've actually plugged it in. So the two valve rectifiers removed and the Vanguard switched on for the first time. All of the valve heat, valves had heat or voltage and all it okay. <coughs> so that was the first test. Next one, um, DC output from the rectifier is disconnected and with both valves fitted, there was a correct output of circa 400 volts from both. Exercise repleted with all the smoothing capacitors and chokes in circuit, so all the, the DC supply was all okay. Uh, so then um, I put 150 volts to the VFO only, and output checked with an oscilloscope and frequency meter. Um, the VFO gave an output, but absolutely way off frequency. Um, the lowest it would go down to is about four megs on uh, 80 meters, so outside the 80 meter band. In the tuned circuit that determines the frequency, someone had removed the fixed capacitor, installed a compression variable capacitor with really poor soldered joints, and wound the, the dust iron coil, the coil um, fully out. Um, why did they do that? I've no idea. But also, the, the trimmer capacitor, I cannot... To me, and this is only my opinion, um, someone got a soldering iron that you warm in the fire, and did it something like that, because the joint was absolutely horrific. It was, all, it was, it was high resistance. Um, so all I did was um, the original capacitor was in there, so I just checked it, it was DC OK, reconnected it, and adjusted the dust iron core, uh, and that suddenly meant the correct output, and I was able to get it to uh, uh, track across the whole of the 80 meter band. Um, then DC supplies were added in stages to all sections of the Vanguard and all worked perfectly. Didn't have to do anything to it, just worked, came up and worked perfectly. The power output of just under 50 watts and in line with the existing spec. Uh, and apart from the 10 metre band, which again, someone had changed the value of a capacitor in the buffer stage. Um, and the, the, the tuning control didn't work, it was, it was, it was out, of, out of range. Um, do you think so, they were trying to change... I, I, I've got an opinion. Um, so all I did was put the, look at the circuit drag and put the right value when it worked perfect. The only thing that went through my mind, that was on the 10 metre range, were they trying to get it to cover the CB band back in the, uh, in the 60s or 70s or something like that, AM, because that would be a fairly good CB uh, with that sort of power output out. That, that's the only thing I could think of. Um, so this is the complete top view. Um, as clean as I can get it. Oh, look, the dial light's lit. Um, and all the new valves in. And, uh, you know, how many times have you done something and then 10 or 15 or 20 years later um, opened it up and thought, oh, what's that for? What's that sort of thing? I thought, right, um, why don't I label all the transformers so that I'll know straight away without, you know, having to delve into it, etc. Um, and likewise... Yeah. If it gets hot, you know, it just goes black. Melts or peels. Yeah, could do, could do. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's the point, yeah. That's yeah. the process it uses to actually yeah. print it. Yeah, of course it does, yeah. Ah, oh, yes, that's true. Okay, well, um, here's the good news. I've got a picture of it. <laughs> uh, and I can expand it right up. But, yeah, good, good point. Yeah, because, yeah, you're right. You yeah, it does. just print um, inkjet onto white paper. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, that's, that. so that's the underside. And again, um, you can probably only see, but again, I've stuck labels on the capacitors yeah. um, so that I know, um, you know, which are the reservoir capacitors and the smoothing capacitors. Uh, and I've labelled up um, what the relays are and everything that I can do, you know, the modulator choke and the RF choke and all these sort of things. So I've and done as much as I can black, do. Then you've got a problem. Absolutely, that absolutely. I'll tell you that. So yeah. It's, uh... Yeah, and there, was n there, was, there wasn't an aluminium plate on the bottom there. So uh, I, uh, I put a message on uh, KW Group IO uh, and said, should there be a plate on? Um, everybody apart from one said, yes, mine's got a plate on. One person said, mine hasn't, doesn't make any difference. And I thought, do you know something? I have a piece of aluminium plate, why don't I stick it on? So that's what I did, put it on. Um, so a new, new aluminium base plate fitted to our section. Right, then, then, of course, finally, the cabinet. 
uh, that's as received. Um, not too bad, I've known much worse. Uh, so it just needed uh, uh, sanding down, rust removal, primer and final hammer finish. And uh, it's, in, it's in my shack, purely and simply, because it stunk the house out. You know, nothing worse than, uh, than, than that sort of hammerite paint. But of course, my shack, as I say, I keep it, uh, keep it a minimum of about 17 degrees. So I just stuck it in there for a couple of days and didn't really go in and do anything. Have you seen my um, my um, QRZ page? No. We'll speak later. Okay, yes, that is a 19 set. Uh, and, and above it is the 19 set high power amplifier, which I modified with two 6.46s to give 50 watts out. Um, and there it is uh, in its permanent location in my shack. Um, and uh, that's the independent stabilised 150 volt supply using cutting edge technology, a VR150. Um, so I keep the VFO running, running all the time uh, when, I'm, when I'm not uh, uh, using the you know, local receiver, speaking to somebody local. Um, and uh, I got a Christmas present of, uh, of a Geloso van because the, uh, the VFO uh, is of Geloso design. Okay, right. So, guys, that's it. Um, I've got a brief recording now of, um, of using it on air today. Um, now, <laughs> this is where me and technology. Um, uh, I did a recording earlier, and the way I did the recording is uh, the web SDRs, and if you're to hear both sides of the conversation um, on air, you need to use an SDR. Um, so there's a good, well, there's several good ones. The best one, Western Supermare, is still down after the storm. Um, they've got major problems. In fact, I messaged you one of the problems they've got with the main supply to it. Um, there's one based in Stafford, which is uh, the Midlands way, isn't it, up at Stafford? Um, and that's quite a good one. Um, so um, what I did is I got my phone and uh, I, oh, the Web SDR itself, you can record the sound only. It records the audio but not the actual uh, uh, display. So what I did is I clicked record and uh, I put the, uh, my uh, smartphone there and uh, pressed record on that and I did a recording and I said to my son, right, how do I add them both together in a presentation? And when he picked himself up from the floor laughing, he said, what the hell are you doing, Dad? He says, there's loads of apps um, that you can download, which will um, record uh, whatever you've got on your screen and whatever you've got on your audio output. Um, so um, I'm going to end the presentation with just a, a quick, um, uh, this is the uh, Stafford uh, Web SDR this afternoon, uh, me putting a CQ call out and a station coming back to me. Um, conditions were not all that good, I have to say this afternoon, but uh, anyway, that's it. So put it on. See how it goes. Right, so this is this is the 80 meter band. That's the whole of the 80 meter band. You see I've highlighted 3615, that's the AM calling channel. So here I come. Uh, 80 meters was deserted this afternoon, conditions were so bad. CQ 80 meters AM from 2E0XBZ. 2E0XBZ calling CQ 80 meters AM. CQ 80 calling CQ 80 meters You can just about see the sidebands, can't you, in the carrier? 2E0XBZ calling CQ 80 meters AM and listening. And as if by absolute miracle,
Um, how are you keeping? Um, the, oh, before I go any further, Mervyn, sorry, I should say, before I go any further, um, you know, we discussed the, uh, uh, the Battle Amateur Radio Club and the presentation I'm giving with Vanguard. This is a, a quick recording. Um, we'll hopefully play at the end of, uh, of my presentation, Mervyn, if there's uh, time. So, just to make you aware that um, you're very famous anyway with, uh, with having uh, videos on, uh, on the YouTube. But just just to make you aware. Anyway, we're going to walk through the looking side of the world. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been really good here today. I must admit, the, uh, the sun's been streaming through the windows in the greenhouse. And uh, we went for a quick walk into to Brattle this morning. And uh, quite nice. A little bit of breeze, but uh, yeah, you certainly can't complain for, for early March. Anyway, before I pass it back to you, um, I must admit, I didn't uh, shake the. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, SBT and the WebSGR using the G4 FH WebSGR at the moment, uh, Mervyn, so I can uh, use it. 20XPZ around to GW TV. That's fine, Mervyn. Okay, right, so <laughs> I'm not going to bore you anymore with uh, the. That's it, that's it, okay, done it. So, that's it. I was running the output of the, uh, the KW Vanguard, yeah. yeah. Um, right, guys, you've been very, very quiet, I must admit. I thought there'd be some questions, etc. cetera, but... Uh, um, any? Yes, yes. Uh, question? Just one comment. Yeah. Yep, agreed. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. much, Martin. Good. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. CQ80 calling CQ80 meters AM from 2E0XBZ. 2E0XBZ calling CQ80 meters AM. CQ80 calling CQ80 meters AM from 2E0XBZ. 2E0XBZ calling CQ80 meters AM and listening. Uh, 2E0XBZ. Uh, 2E0XBZ. GW8TBT calling uh, Martin over. Hello, Mervyn. That was a that was a quick uh, quick comeback to me there, uh, Mervyn. Uh, must admit, looking at uh, the band today, conditions are, uh, are not very good at all. They're uh, they're certainly very much up to up and down and. Uh, and looking on the web uh, SDR, Mervyn, it's uh, very, very, very quiet. So, uh, I hope conditions uh, improve uh, shortly, Mervyn. Anyway, um, how are you keeping? Um, the, oh, before I go any further, Mervyn, sorry, I should say, before I go any further, um, you know, we discussed the, uh, uh, the Brand Limiter Radio Club and the presentation I'm giving on the Vanguard. This is a, this is a quick recording. Um, so, we'll hopefully play at the end of, uh, of my presentation, Mervyn, if there's... Uh, Time. So just to make you aware that um, you're very famous anyway with, uh, with having uh, videos on uh, on uh, YouTube, etc. But just just to make you aware. Anyway, what are we really liking Swansea today with you, Mervyn? It's uh, it's been it's been really good here today. I must admit the uh, the sun's been streaming through the windows in the greenhouse, and uh, we went for a quick walk into to Brattle this morning and. Uh, Quite nice. A little bit of breeze, but uh, you know you certainly can't complain for uh, for early March. Anyway, before I go pass it back to you. Um, good signal. Uh, I must admit, I didn't uh, check the uh, uh, the uh, uh, SME and the Web SDR using the G4 FPH Web SDR at the moment, uh, Mervyn, so I can uh, I can easily. Right, 
Mr. Mervyn. 2E0XBZ, round to GJ TBG. Yeah, that's fine, Martin. Uh, 2E0XBZ, the GW TBG uh, returning. <laughs> okay, on the recording, Martin. Fine. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I think you will find, Martin, uh, there is some clarity on, uh, on the path between us. I'm copying the way. And uh, you're picking up to uh, around the nine, just over the nine mark, and uh, taking you down slightly. But you're uh, you're very nice, nice otherwise, and um, nice and very nice audio. Uh, and uh, uh, well, otherwise, well, it, it was okay this morning. It was uh, dry, but they did focus rain, which is at the road now, and. Um, the uh, the worker was having gun outside with uh, uh, with a builder. Uh, that's all on stop for the well, they more or less completed it now and uh, uh, come back tomorrow morning and uh, finish off. Uh, right. Um, yes, uh, as I say, bond conditions, Martin, are not uh, not very good. I've been listening. Uh, well, I switched on about half an hour ago and had a quick tune around and. Uh, uh, things, uh, uh, you know, they're not uh, not all that uh, clever at the moment. Perhaps they'll pick up as uh, time goes on. Uh, right, uh, the transmitter I'm using, Martin, is um, a Collins 32V3 and uh, built around or produced around about the 1950 era in, um, in America, uh, 50, 53, and uh, 2807s in the modulator. And uh, a, a race on uh, 4D32 in the uh, American uh, valve. And uh, two diamonds come off. 100 watts of car work. And the microphone is in a static 104. And uh, the receiver is a Collins R398, uh, which uh, was originally used uh, from the, according to the tab on the front, um, uh, by the uh, United States Army. Um, it covers uh, right up from uh, frequencies right up to 30 meg, so it's got a complete uh, coverage. All valve, of course. And the aerial is uh, an inverted V fed with uh, 450 ohm into a, a Johnson kilowatt matchbox, which is another piece of American vintage equipment. So that's the uh, the setup I'm using at the moment, uh, Martin. Uh, haven't been doing uh, very uh, very much this morning, actually. Uh, been going through some magazines, and uh, I got quite a few to sort out here. I'd uh, uh, forgotten I'd had, uh, so I need to uh, uh, put those in in order. Um, so I've been uh, been uh, doing that. Okay, I better put it back to you, Martin. Hopefully, the uh, the signal's holding up over there in Bracknell. Uh, uh, and by the way, the QTH here, uh, Swansea, uh, as you know, north north of Swansea, ten miles north of Swansea. Two uh, E zero X ray Bravo Zulu G W A T B G over. Yes. Okay. Absolutely uh, no problem at all. Um, good. Uh, good. <laughs> I'm receiving the direct as well, Mervyn. Um, just bear with me a second. I haven't had the Vanguard on too long, so bear with me a second. Well, I just... Uh I just, I just uh, need just to just <laughs> bring it on. And see, it's, uh, it's moved uh, a little bit, uh, um, uh, in, but uh, yeah, all, all, all copied. Although uh, uh, quite, quite a significant uh, QSB moving on, uh, on, 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 on the signal. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's that time of day. Isn't it, unfortunately, I mean, you were, you were picking uh, up, up to the nine and dropping right back, and then picking back up to the nine, etc. Uh, and I'm just looking at the S meter, so so am I as well on the on the on the, on the STR. But uh, yes, all copied. And uh, yes, I mean, I, I actually quite like your uh, Collins 2 V3, uh, Mervyn. It's uh, it, it's got um, re really nice audio, really nice modulation on it. Too. And, uh, Nice and, uh, nice and punchy and nice and, nice and easy to listen to, if you know what I mean, uh, Mervyn, and uh, yeah, I mean, well, you, you know the antenna at uh, this end, it's, uh, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a compromise, it's about as best as I can do with a long wire, but uh, it seems to get out, uh, get out reasonably well. 
Even now, even into Europe, when I do the, um, you know, the, the, the sideman match, so the, uh, the, well, there's the VMAS sideman that isn't on, on a Wednesday, which, uh, which to a certain extent conflicts with uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the club net, but I, I normally join the, uh, uh, the, the European uh, 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 upper sideman sorry, net, um, at 8 o'clock and just, uh, just say hello and that and then join the, uh, the, the club net uh, moving.